All right, we're live. Micah, would you like to do the honors? Sure. I will get up the little page here. One second. All right. May 24. I have so many tabs. Okay. It is May 24, 2018. I'm Micah Sargent, and right now we are going to talk about 1Password 7 for Mac. We're going to talk about Castro 3. We're going to talk about WWDC. That rhymed. It's great. And quite a bit more, because this is the iMore Show. Now, joining me this week, I'm going to go ahead and, and get, the, get the regulars out of the way. We've got Lori Gill, the one and only, the steadfast and true, who's always here for us on the iMore Show. Uh, welcome, Lori, who is frozen for me at the moment. Is frozen for you too as well? Yeah. Okay. She's frozen because she is steadfast. There, that's she what is it is. Steadfastly, yeah, yes, steadfastly here her. for us. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let's see. Uh, let me do this this way. Uh, good, she's hopped out. Uh, okay. Can we wait for her? Okay, is she back? I don't know. <laughs> I love people. Uh, technical difficulties. Always fun. Let me give her a second. This is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a great first impression, guys. <laughs> it's real strong. Yeah, it's it. You know what? We are nothing if not professionals here, uh, who are unfortunately indebted to Google Hangouts and all of its <laughs> hangout eness. Is it's all stuff. good? It's it's cutting the tension for me. It's it's totally good. Fine. There you go. Yeah, Great. this is low. All low we're doing is hanging out, hanging out on video. Quite honestly, here. Fantastic. I've got my non-alcoholic spritzer. So we're nice. we're good to go, you know. We're one we're one bottle of whiskey away from this just being a happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh lordy! Um, so Lori says she lost the connection, which is interesting because the show still shows that it's live. Um, the broadcast is live. So I, I sorry, I just want to give her one more second because. Is because there a chat room that I should be watching to to get distracted by to see if people have questions? Um, yes, if you go to here, I will post it in our personal chat room. Um, there's Lori. We don't end up having um, too many people that tune in during. Uh, it's usually they go and watch it afterward. But here is the public link. And within that uh, public link, you'll see out to the side is a little chat room. Okay. Um, and you can actually, if you hit the three dots, then you can just do a pop out of the chat. And that way you don't have to uh, have that page open. You know, uh, in light of the difficulties we've had thus far, I'm just going to keep it super simple and just focus on the video. All right, here we go. We're going to start over and we're going to make this happen. It is May 24, 2018. I'm Micah Sargent. And right now we're going to talk about 1Password 7 for Mac, Castro 3, WWDC, Apple's GDPR compliance, and so much more. Because as usual, this is the iMore Show. Joining me this week is the one and only Lori Gill. Once again, always here, always steadfast. We're so happy to have you. How are you doing, Lori? Very good, thanks. How are you doing today? Uh, just peachy, peachy keen. Excellent. And, and we are blessed to be joined by Serenity Caldwell. How you doing, Serenity? Hello, I am doing well. I am excited to be here as always and looking forward to talking about Dub Dub. Yes, awesome. And our special guest this week is Michael Fay from One Password from Agile Bits from you know the the big the big group of of awesome products that we love to use here at uh, at iMore. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing very well. How are you, Micah? I'm great. So happy to have you here. And look, it's the first topic we're going to discuss. One Password Seven for Mac is out. Uh, I've been using the beta for a little while and have been loving the new One Password Mini. Um, it's fantastic. And now every time iTunes bugs me twelve billion thousand times to log into my account, I can drag and drop my password instead of having to type it in or go and copy and paste it. Uh, do you want to give us sort of a a, a a big overview of what's new. What can people get excited about with One Password Seven for Mac? Yeah, so it, living in the in the details for the last few months, like I have, it's it's nice to finally sort of take a step back and look at everything that we've done and 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 get to talk about it at a macro level. So yeah, One Password Seven. It's our first paid upgrade in like five years. Like we, you know, we la we shipped One Password Four 
And then when we did 1Password 5, that was a free update. Then we did 1Password 6, and we made that a free update too. And then for 1Password 7, we're like, oh, okay. I think that we've, we've done enough. Of, like, we've, we've done enough. <laughs> it's time to have a paid upgrade. Uh, and so we did. So this is our first paid upgrade in a long time. Uh, 1Password subscribers, people that have 1Password accounts, they'll get it for, it's included as part of their membership. Um, but yeah, we've we've done so much in this release. But you, you hit on a couple of, of things uh, that are some of my favorites. Um, we now show the logins that you need for the apps that you're that you're using at the time. So like you said, if you bring up uh, 1Password Mini when you're in iTunes, you'll see your Apple ID right there waiting for you. And you can just drag and drop your username and your password over. And it's it's awesome. There have been a couple of times when I've used it. And afterwards, I was like, oh, that's right. We did that. And that was super <laughs> great to use. Um, the other thing that we've done that I am super excited about is our all new Watchtower uh, feature and Watchtower is something we had in, in One Password Six, but it was it was pretty focused, and we've taken and just like blown it up in One Password Seven. Watchtower is our security audit feature, and it uh, it watches for compromised websites. It now watches for compromised passwords. So if you are if one of your logins has a password that has been exposed in an online breach somewhere, we now securely check that and let you know. Uh, we also let you know if any of your any of your logins support two-factor authentication and you're not using it. Uh, we let you know about weak passwords, duplicate passwords, and also uh, just for fun, we threw in things like expiring passports and expiring credit cards to let you know ahead of time when those things are, are going to be going away. So I am really re that's that's one of my favorite features of One Password Seven because we've taken We've taken one password from a tool that helps keep you safe online and now drives you to stay safe online. Like we're we're being very upfront about the fact that hey, this this thing that you're that you're looking at, there's a problem and you should go fix it. And I think that it's really going to change people's habits when it comes to to good online password health. And so that's that's one of the things that I'm really really excited about. Yeah, I made the joke that it sort of shames you into updating your passwords to to add two factor authentication, and like that used to be my job with family members who I've convinced to use one password, and now I don't have to be, do the shaming. The app's going to take care of that for me, so that's been pretty great. Because yeah. there, I mean, we've seen lots of sites get two factor authentication, and they're not always like. I think now they're starting to get a little bit more wise to sharing that on their various social media accounts. But it's kind of been a, a thing that's tucked away in the past because people are like, what is two-factor authentication? And so I'm glad that you know now I have this one place I can go and say, no way, my favorite online coffee subscription service has two-factor authentication that's great yeah it's really neat we uh so we integrated with with two different services uh with with one password seven the first is uh two-factor auth.org it maintains a list of like a constantly updating list of of sites that support two-factor authentication and we periodically will pull from that so that you're always you know as sites adopt two-factor authentication you will have the you know you'll be notified of that in in one password and the other is uh troy hunt have I been pwned service that's what we're using for uh, secure password checking and and it's a it's a database of 500 million passwords you know half a billion passwords that that he has collected from various breaches uh, on the internet and and compile them into one location and now we can securely check to see if any of your passwords show up in that list of, of breaches and say hey this is something you might want to change because it's you know it's on a list of that hackers and crackers are going to use to try and focus their their attack vectors and stuff Can like you that so. talk about that just a little bit more if so if it's if it's just that you happen to have the same password as a password that has been exposed um is that is that what it's referring to or is it specifically your account and your password with different accounts so for the have i been pwned checks it is you have a password that has been breached somewhere else it is not necessarily your password um another way to look at it is it highlights common passwords uh you know obviously things like password one show up in there or p at s s w zero o r d shows up in there you know like the common things that people are like well, i got a number and a symbol in there i'm i'm a <laughs> password genius you know uh and now it's like you're not though because everyone has had that same thought uh yeah. and so it's it's that um it's one of those checks where it's like you're not in imminent danger of like of a breach that's what our watchtower functionality that's that's what the like the classic watchtower functionality was is um under Armour, you know, recently had had a breach, which they handled so so well. Like they did 
their communication to their customers was fantastic. Uh, if you had a My Fitness Pal login in your in your vault, we flagged that as this had a breach. Like your username and password are at risk. You need to go and change that. So that's that's sort of the difference between like having a pwned password versus having a, a like an actual breached login. Right. Yeah. The, which is fantastic because I don't think that everybody realizes, even if they receive an email, they might just kind of oh that that couldn't be me and just sort of dismiss that that idea that maybe their their password has been breached and having a notification of hey you need to do something about this it's uh it's a lot better a lot more clear and easy to understand for people that aren't necessarily tech savvy so yeah yep absolutely yeah. Now, for the the font nerds among us, the type nerds, the the typographers, um, I was certainly very excited to see the custom typeface that was designed uh, for One Password and the you know the sort of upgrade, I guess, to Notes and the the addition of Markdown. Can you talk a little bit about sort of you know, where did that come from? Because it's not every day that a a service is like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pay somebody to make us our own typeface. Where'd that come from? And just your, your general thoughts on adding Markdown and things like that to notes. Sure, sure. So the custom typeface, uh, the designer of, of the font, Alan Day Green, and I, I hope that I'm pronouncing his last name correctly because I've only ever read it, uh, is he, he actually approached us gosh, it was probably like 18 months ago. And he's like, hey, listen, I'm a big 1Password fan. I have this this font that I've designed. Uh, it's it's called wow. Courier Prime. I, I've developed a special one for 1Password. I was wondering if you guys wanted to include it. And we were like, uh, yeah, we super do. So <laughs> it was it was one of those cases where um, so, like someone who was, who was a fan of ours came to us with this awesome thing. And how could we possibly say no? So like it's... You know, we we've now got Courier Prime Bits. That's our custom font, and it's it's fantastic. It's a beautiful font. Uh, it, you know, it's great for for showing passwords and stuff like that. And we, in fact, we also use it in our uh, our new Markdown rendering stuff. So if you if you happen to render, you know, certain Markdown allows you to render things in preformatted tags, basically fixed width uh, font tags and stuff like that. Um, you know, we use the font there as well. So Markdown rendering is something that we've sort of we've wanted ourselves. For a long time, you know, we have internal to Agile Bits. We have a lot of notes, uh, secure notes that we we share for various things. I mean, we use it for, gosh, things like how to do a performance review of, of one of your team members. To uh, here's a script that you can use to read if you are recording a demonstration video for something. And in all of these things, we've just sort of over time naturally formatted with Markdown uh, Markdown uh, formatting. And so we're, we're like, you know, this would, it would be great to render this. Like, it's fine. You know, Markdown is great because you can actually, you, it's, it's a readable uh, markup language, but uh, it would just be so much better if we could actually render it. And so we, we endeavored to do that and, and we, we got it done. And it was really neat is that we did it in such a way, um, this is a little inside baseball, but as a nerd, I'm proud of it nonetheless. Uh, we did it in such a way that all the platforms get it for free, more or less. We, we wrote it into a common library that all of us link against so that you know 1Password for Mac gets it, 1Password for iOS gets it, but also 1Password for Android, 1Password uh, for Windows, and 1Password uh, X, which is our Chrome and Firefox extension. Like All of our products get it at once. And that's something that we've really been trying to push is, is sort of having feature parity across all the versions of 1Password. And so this is one of our first steps in doing that. And it's it's really cool. Like You'll start to see it roll out to our other, our other products pretty soon. Ooh, that's excellent. So there's a little uh, hint for those of you uh, tuning in live. Now, I I have one. This is this is a bit of a challenge, and this is, I'm interested to hear your your answer to this. So, I've got let's say I've got some some family members who have I love cats with a few zeros and threes and things thrown in there, and they're just using it across their entire you know, the, all of their accounts online are using these passwords. We all have that person in we our life. We all have that person or those <laughs> people. How do you recommend convincing those people in our lives who we know would be so much better off with one password? How do we convince them to get one password? What is the, the, what's your pitch to, to the less techie people? Sure. So the really cool thing about one password is that it is a tool that everyone needs. There is no niche for for a password manager. One password is something that everybody actually needs. So you can always start there. Um, 
And, you know, the, the elevator pitch that I kind of give to people is, uh, you know, you might trust that your bank is has really good online security and they're probably not going to get breached. But so, you know, using a password for that is, is completely fine. But the place where you order your coffee subscriptions, you don't necessarily know that they've got bank level security. And if you're using the same password to order your coffee as you are to pay your bills, you've now opened yourself up to an incredible attack vector. Mm. and. If one of those things is breached, all of them are breached. And so what 1Password does is it lets you create a single password that you know, your master password. And behind that, you can create strong, unique passwords for all of your all of your various services, which is, you know, that's that's really good password health. And now, if there's a breach somewhere, not only will we notify you of it, but you can sort of rest easy knowing that your entire digital life didn't just get cracked wide open. It was just one tiny little site somewhere that you can go and fix. Um, the other, in terms of, you know, as, as sort of more, uh, people like us who are, you know, we live and breathe this stuff every single day. We were very comfortable with it. Um, for family members in particular, I found, you know, you sign up for a a one password family subscription, you get, you help, uh, want your family members install one password on their devices if, if you like, and get them set up. And then from there on, you can almost guide them through, changing their passwords remotely. I mean, you know, my wife and I share a vault and there are things that, well, after we rolled out the, you know, some of the new security audit features, there were passwords that were cropping up and I was like, oh, honey, you reused that old password again. <laughs> and that, but, I mean, it was great. I could just go change it and it would update automatically across all our devices, you know, her devices, my devices, everything. Um, so using a family, a family account to sort of help manage things for people that might not be as, as literate as you um, is certainly a good step. Uh, but honestly, like I've found, you know, with, a, with some of my family members, once I've gotten them introduced to it, once I've said like, here's this thing, you know, here's a quick introduction to how it works. They're off to the races and they're just, it just sort of fits right into their normal, their normal use case. You know, as you use, as you use your web browser naturally to go and log into things, one password is going to be asking you, Hey, do you want to save this in one password? And you just say, Yes. And that's really the best way to get started, right? Because now you're just building up your collection of information inside one password through your normal workflow. And then later you can go and and step through Watchtower and say, oh, I see. I see what I've done. I see what I've done here and start to fix that stuff. So um, that's that's really my, my, big, my biggest uh, recommendation is just get it installed and get them set up and then cut them loose. And it should should just slot right into their normal workflow. Excellent. I think that's good advice. And in fact, I'm just going to cut that audio and send it to everybody. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> I like uh, the idea of a family subscription. I think that's a, a really easy way to, I think with some of my family members, especially, they're intimidated by it. They, they're they used to doing it one way and they're intimidated by the, the change. So having a family subscription so that you can kind of help set that up for them. So once it's set up, all they have to do is type in their their um, one password password, and then they see everything. I think that's going to be the aha moment for them to realize like, oh, this is actually much easier than I originally had thought. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've done that uh, with a couple of my family members. They're on they're on our family account. And it's like, yeah, they're just happily rolling along, like no trouble. And what's neat as like a as a family organizer, what do we call it? Uh, it's admin? team leader, family, yeah, a family admin, right? Uh, you can you can help recover someone's account. So if like, you know, oh. your mother comes to you and they're like, I forgot my master password. You're like, that's no problem. I'll just reset it. Like I, I'll put you into recovery mode and they get an email and they get to just go and set their, you know, change their master password and they're, they're good to go. That's um, fantastic. This, I'm going to become my family savior today. <laughs> yeah, you, you totally should. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Okay. Well, before we move on, I am curious. One one last thing maybe uh, that you've been really excited about that maybe people haven't noticed or like a, a hidden feature that you uh, and the team are really proud of. Basically, anything that maybe we may, we may have missed uh, in the sort of press rollout that you think is is worth discussing or talking about or pointing out? So the other really big thing that I think is going to be absolutely incredible, particularly in in family environments and in team environments, because, you know, we have one password for individuals, one password families, one password for teams and one password for business. Like those are sort of our four subscription tiers. And in uh, in the family and, and team and business environments in particular, 
uh, the ability to better utilize multiple vaults in one password seven is is pretty incredible in in my opinion so one password has had this concept of vaults and even multiple vaults for a number of versions and when we rolled out one password.com we sort of we built upon that a little bit more so that you have you have your personal vault inside your account and then uh, within a family environment, you have a shared vault. And, and similar within a team, you have a shared vault where ev that everybody has access to and you can share information. For a long time, we've had the ability to also create additional vaults, but it's been something that has really just lived in the web interface of 1password.com. And in, in 1Password 7 for Mac, we said, okay, like this this is fine. Like it's, We've supported multiple vaults for a long time, but now it's time to make them just freaking awesome. And so uh, now with 1Password 7, you can you can uh, reveal your list of vaults right in the sidebar. You can create multiple vaults. You can drag and drop items to different vaults. Uh, you can choose who you want to share them with right from within the Mac app. Um, you can even drag, you can select a whole bunch of items and drag and drop them to the new vault button and it will make a new vault right in place and then move all those items into it. That's actually something that I used after we had this feature written. Uh, I was working with one of, one of the guys on my team who was writing the markdown rendering issue stuff. And I ran into a small rendering issue with one of my notes. I said, I need to get this to Anthony. Oh, I know. I revealed the vault list. I dragged a couple of the items to the new vault thing, created a new vault right in place, then managed it so that Anthony could get access to it. And I said, okay, you're all like, I texted him on Slack. I was like, you're all set. You should have a vault that's called like, you know, Michael's Markdown mess or something. And, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, no, I got it. And it was so ridiculously seamless that I was able to just instantly securely share something with someone else on my team. I was like, oh my gosh, people are going to love this. Like it was, it was one of those aha moments that I was like, something that we wrote is freaking cool. I can't wait to get to roll this out. So that's, that's one of my hidden gems is, 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 I mean, it's not, you know, we, we talk about it a lot, but I consider that something that like everyone should check out, especially in a team and family environment, because you really can get fine-grained control over how you share things. I mean, you know, I, I shared that just with Anthony. Uh, I could have shared it with the entire Apple development team if I wanted to with just a single click. Um, in the family environment, you know, I've got vaults that my wife and I have access to, uh, but my mom and my brother do not because they don't need to know about, you know, our estate planning vault or something like that. So, right. you know, there's a lot of power and flexibility there, and we've exposed a lot of that in 1Password 7, and, I'm, and I think that it's going to really drive and change how people organize their information going forward. Excellent. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, well, certainly, thank you for giving us a, an, a big overview and, and diving down into some yeah. of the, the features there. Um, any last questions from from, uh, from Renner Lori before we move on? No, I just want to thank you again, Michael. It was really, it's really interesting to hear the genesis of the app from one of the developers itself. I think it's a, it's it's kind of like getting a peek behind the curtain as it, as it would. And we really appreciate you coming on. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. It's 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 fun to talk about this thing that we've spent the last six, 12, 12 months making. So yeah, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay, now before we head on to the next topic, uh, Lori, fire up your browser because it's time to tell everybody about our friends at Thrifter. Thrifter, of course, is a way to save money on everything from gadgets to home goods by shopping based on value and not hype. That means you're going to get the best deals possible. It's not those silly fake deals that retailers love to put into place to trick your little mind. Uh, if you sign up at thrifter.com, you're going to get thoughtfully selected tech deals from places like Amazon and Best Buy and also new products and new services that are coming out. You'll hear from them first over at Thrifter. It's all the stuff, none of the fluff at thrifter.com. Lori has been perusing Thrifter's website to find an awesome deal that you can check out. And now it's time to figure out what that one is. Here's yeah. a really great deal, especially now that the weather is starting to change and we're going to get into the hotter times of the year. Uh, Nest is on sale for $70 off. That makes it only $150 at Costco. So if you have a Costco membership, you're gonna get a really good deal on Nest Thermostat, third generation. That's not so bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's actually that's a very good deal. Um, yeah. And with 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 summer coming up too, uh, we've got Fourth of July not too far away. And you know, people sometimes will want to go to a Fourth of July celebration. If you've got pets, you don't really want to bring them to those celebrations because of the loud fireworks. It's not not great for pets' anxiety. So you might 
want to leave your pets at home, safe inside the house, locked away from those really loud noises, but you might want to check in on them so you can check in on them and uh, make sure everything's good to go. Uh, and so yeah, Nest's products, uh, having those deals, they've got the Nest Cam and the Nest Thermostat and all that jazz, and they all work together quite well. Um, so you can keep track of that. Uh, all right. So again, that is thrifter.com. You can sign up on the website to get thoughtfully selected deals. It's all the stuff, none of the fluff. Thanks so, so much to Thrifter for sponsoring this week's episode of The iMore Show. Uh, let's quickly talk about the podcast app. Uh, it just got a huge update. It's Castro 3. And, you know, Interestingly, Castro is it's a bit different from I think the podcast apps that we're used to using. Michael, I'm curious to hear if you listen to podcasts and what apps uh, or app you're using to do so. Um, but Lori, do you want to give us a little bit of a rundown on what has uh, what, what what has changed or has been introduced in Castro three? Yes. Okay. So let's see here. <laughs> Sorry. I was, I'm on the spot right now. Uh, so it looks like, okay, so Castro now has a trim silence feature, um, which is actually not entirely unlike Overcast smart speed feature. So I think that um, Overcast fans will be happy to hear that um, there's, or, well, actually, People who use Overcast but are maybe interested in a variety of podcast apps will be happy to hear that um, Castro now has a feature very similar. Um, it's probably one of their biggest uh, feature changes. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm reading about it. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So uh, silence will get cut from it. So it trims out any of those pauses like the one that I just purposefully did um, to make your podcast kind of move a little faster. So if you're kind of, you know, you have a tight hour to get through it and it's an hour and, you know, 35 seconds long, it'll cut out a couple of those unnecessary pauses and, and silences. So just trim some out for you. It's really nice. Um, Castro also now has um, chapter support uh, love, for, for podcasts that actually have chapters, which I know not all of them do, but um, if it does, if it's a podcast that does have chapters, then um, Castro now does have chapter support with it. Uh, you can mix to mono. Um, I'm not exactly sure why somebody would mono mix. Does anybody have any ideas as to why you would do that? Uh, it's, I think it's because some, some podcasts when, if they're using like a stereo microphone setup, then the, the person might be on the left or the right more. And so yeah. it might sound a little, ick, but by combining those two channels together, you're okay. going to hear, you know, full sound. There's yes. also the aspect of a lot of people like to listen to podcasts and music in general in one headphone. So if you just have one AirPod in, you're going to want to make sure that you have a mono mix so that you don't miss say an entire section of the conversation. Right. Or if you happen to have um, hearing, uh, loss of hearing in one ear and not another, that, that actually makes a lot of sense for people who have um, better hearing in one ear than the other. So yeah, that now that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> and a uh, new Apple Watch app, which is pretty fantastic. Apple Watch apps for podcasting is fantastic. You can um, pause, play, uh, skip ahead, um, rewind, um, switch to the next podcast. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, a Castro, I think, gets po points for uh, is the way that their their whole setup is a little bit different. I use Pocket Casts uh, for my listening on the web and on the Mac and on my iPhone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it and Overcast and Apple's podcast app and many of the other ones, they all have this sort of you subscribe to a show, it pops up in your feed, you listen to it, and you know, then you have the rest of them there to listen to as well. Castro has a nice triage feature where maybe you don't really want to subscribe to a podcast, but you're just interested in hearing an episode that someone's recommended in the past, uh, or that you know, you you come across and you just want to hear the one episode, but you don't want to stick around. Well, their triage feature sort of lets you listen to an episode and then you can move on to whatever's next in your feed and keep going and going and listening and listening. And so people whose minds, I think, work in this in this fashion as opposed to the more traditional setup are happy to see now that they don't have they can they can keep this this uh, triage 
way of doing things, but now they also get features that are available in the other apps because trim silence is a pretty universal feature for any third party podcast app, uh, chapter support as well. Mixed to mono, that's a new thing. I think that's uh, pretty interesting. But a lot of these features, you know, are in the the more premium third party podcast apps. And so now they don't they get to have their key, their cake and eat it too, as opposed to just having their cake in the past. Um, Michael, I'm curious, what what do you listen to podcasts? Are you a big podcast listener? And what app do you use for podcast listening? Yeah, so I I listen to a number of podcasts. I have an enormous podcast backlog, as I'm sure uh, many <laughs> folks do. Um, and uh, yeah, I use I used podcast the Apple Podcast app for a long, long time, uh, and then I switched over to Overcast, and I've I've been really happy with Overcast, in particular, like the Smart Speed feature, much like Castro's Trim Silence feature. Uh, it's it's great. Like uh, Overcast even has like a little, I think it's in the settings you can see how many minutes you've saved using smart smart speed uh which i think is super cool so yeah it it's one of the things that i really love about this is that um this is one of those areas where apple has an app but there is an entire third party market for podcast apps i mean you know you you can use and and i'm guessing that it's kind of like um you know, it's a little bit like one password when app, when apple rolls out like a a new feature a new keychain feature, a new password feature integrated into Safari or something, it sort of uh, the rising tide raises all ships. It gets people more aware of the fact that podcasts are a thing or that password managers are a thing and and creates this this market where these these third party apps can can thrive. I think that's super cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Serenity, any thoughts on on Castro three or what what podcasts? Ooh, what podcast player do you use? <sighs> this is my dirty secret. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts because I don't, don't have don't. time. Because <laughs> uh, you're too busy the, recording podcasts. Yeah, no. I mean, honestly, this is the this is the eternal uh, gr like grief of the writer because podcasts are very hard to listen to when you're also typing. Uh, so the only time I really get to listen to podcasts is in the car. Um, and honestly, I've just been using Apple's default podcast player only because I can ask Siri to play podcasts now. So it's just the easiest way for me to do it. But I am really intrigued by Castro having a watch app. I know Overcast attempted to do a watch app for a while, and it was very tricky because uh, as, as Marco Arment, a uh, developer of Overcast, has explained many times, uh, watch apps are kind of broken right now. Like it's really hard to do audio control and smart like backgrounding with a watch app, even with the new APIs that Apple has put in. And it's semi-related, something I hope comes to watch OS 5. Uh, but I, I am curious to see how Castro handles the watch app. So I'm going to be downloading it and giving it a try because when I'm not using Siri in the car, I will occasionally use the watch to really quickly like change state, like change podcasts or like change the speed. For instance, Apple's default podcast player allows you to change the speed right on your watch. Uh, so it's really easy to like keep my hands on the wheel and literally just tap a button and then continue going on. Like it's a it's a much simpler way of controlling podcasts, at least for me. So yes, I'm interested in that. Excellent. Um, so my dirty secret, the uh, the first part is that I say, yes, I listen to podcasts. But the part that I don't say is that I really only listen to like the first half of podcasts. And the reason why is because I'm usually asleep by the second half. I like to listen to podcasts as I fall asleep. It gets that part of my brain that wants to think about a billion things right before bed to focus on something and lock onto something. And so I'll be listening to a podcast and let that part of my brain sort of uh, be held up and then I can fall asleep pretty easily. So uh, to the ones that I do listen to, that ends up being how, how I end up listening to them. But uh, I, I agree with Michael in terms of the, the you know, third party apps getting this attention, getting this popularity and sort of a reminder, hey, you know, these are out here. They're doing great things. These features are awesome. And let's keep doing this and keep keeping this uh this this what is my what is the word i'm looking for ecosystem open and uh available to everybody so good work there uh serenity why don't you lead off the next topic because you've been excited to talk about wwdc i have been excited to talk about wwdc it is my favorite time of the year no joke forget iphone launches and all of that i really love wwdc because it's the time when we get to play with all of the software. Uh, and, and honestly, like 
what I really love about it, um, and I speak as somebody who's gotten, who's had the opportunity to go down to San Jose and before that uh, San Francisco for the last four years, is really being around the community. Uh, it's really the only major event that the Apple community has once a year at this point with Macworld Expo kind of going the way of the dodo. Um, and it's an amazing experience to, to meet a wide variety of people inside and outside your circles. As Laurie and I were saying before the show, it's where we met Michael a few years back. Um, I, you know, it's, uh, it's where Stephen Hackett and I coined the like idea of making query on Relay FM. Like it's, it's a, it's an amazing place to, uh, meet your heroes, meet people you don't know yet, uh, form friendships for like, talk about your apps, talk about your life and how it relates to Apple. It's just, it's an amazing, amazing experience on the ground. Um, but for people who aren't going to WWDC, um, and just are like, okay, why do I care? This is also like Google IO a few, a few weeks back. This is Apple's once a year time to really talk in depth about its platform, uh, its software and where kind of the roadmap for where iOS and Mac OS and TV OS and watch OS and HomePod OS. God, there's a lot of OS's at this point, uh, but it's where, it's where it's all going, right? Uh, and Apple, you know, Apple is a traditionally very secretive company and for good reason, you know, it's really hard to innovate when people are at your back with photocopiers um, and vice versa, which is not to say that like, there are some really amazing things coming out of Google and Microsoft lately that are obviously are unique. Um, but at the same time, it's like everybody wants to protect their IP, right? And I, so I see why Apple wants to be secretive most of the year. But what I really appreciate about WWDC is it's kind of the one time a year that we not only see a peak of what's coming next, uh, but we also get to see how they're really thinking about the software uh, with all of the sessions. And the sessions, you do need a developer account to view the sessions online or obviously a pass to view the sessions in person. Uh, but there's a lot of really in-depth information that's like I, I as a, you know, I would say I'm a moderately tech savvy, but I am not a developer by any means. I do not code Swift. I have tried. I have failed. Uh, my front end development is about where I where I get my HTML CSS development is my, my peak here. Uh, but I love watching the sessions because the engineers have so much passion for their product and they're able to describe everything in such clean cut, interesting ways. Like I always after WWDC week, if there's something I want to know more about, I go back and I watch the session. And what's really nice is they have transcriptions attached to them now. Um, they have all the slides attached to them now. So if you don't have the time, again, uh, to watch uh, an hour and 10 minutes of uh, someone talking about WatchKit, you can browse through the transcript, you can look at the slides. Um, and, and what I also appreciate, I feel like I'm like, this, 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 this. Uh, they've really been trying to make the sessions more widely accessible in addition to the hardcore engineering sessions. Like Apple will always have the like, let's talk about Core ML and all of the slides are going to be heavy duty Swift. But at the same time, they'll also talk about machine learning from a human perspective. And they'll talk about the actual like principles and why it's important. Um, Apple had an amazing session last year on accessibility, uh, an amazing session on icon design like that. In that one session, I feel like I learned more about how Apple designers think about building their icons than five years prior. Like it's 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 a really, really cool experience to see inside the mind of Apple's engineers, Apple's product staff. And also we get a sneak peek at new goodies which is, you know, and even if they're not hardware goodies and they, they may or may not be, you know, I'm always crossing my fingers for an Apple Pencil 2 and a new version of the iPad Pro. We're about the right time for it. But even if that doesn't happen, I'm really excited to see what they're going to do with watchOS. I'm really excited to see what's next for iPhone, especially with the flexibility that the iPhone 10 has in terms of gestures. I'm just excited. I tell? agree with Serenity. <laughs> the, the software that really does make your phone shine, uh, especially now that Apple isn't really doing a lot of major changes with the physical design of the iPhone. You can go buy a brand new iPhone 8 and it looks exactly like the brand new iPhone 7. So that doesn't feel as fantastic and new as when you download the new the new software and you see all these awesome changes and you see how Apple has integrated things better and made things more 
uh, easy to find. And oh, I, the software updates are definitely the best. They really do make your phone feel brand new again when when big things come out, when things change. Yeah. That, see, this is an interesting thing because I was just talking about this on Clockwise yesterday. Um, we Kelly Gamont was on and she was talking about how uh, there will always be sort of the, the, the people after WWDC happens who complain that Apple's not innovating enough or not doing this or doing that, blah, blah, blah. And it's tough because I think that people who maybe aren't as steeped in this as we are, um, they are more likely to find excitement and interest in things that they can touch and hold and feel and love. And software features aren't that. And so we can talk about all of this awesome new software and talk about how it, um, you know, all of these features are going to change the way that we do this, that, and the other. But a lot of times people are like, but, but what's the new thing I can buy? Um, and Michael, I'm actually curious to hear your thoughts on this because, you know, working, working on a software application, is this something that, that do, do you struggle or does the team struggle with sort of communicating how software changes can make a huge difference just as much as buying a new, especially now that this is a paid upgrade. Um, how do you sort of navigate that? No, there's nothing physical, but this is still really friggin' awesome. You, you know, interesting, interestingly enough, with it being the first paid upgrade in five years, we, we really had to tackle this problem because before it was like, well, we have a free update out there and it's awesome. And here's what's new. And, yeah, go check it out and see for yourself. And now it's it's like, here's what's awesome, and here's why you you know you should you should pay to 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 use this. Um, and Mike, I lost the track. Ask me the question one more time. <laughs> My question is essentially how yeah how do you handle that 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 bit of that contingent of disappointment that comes from uh, you know not having some new shiny thing, and how do you communicate? we have this, 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 these awesome new features. It's not hardware, but here is why you should get it. Um, how do you, you know, sort of, I guess convince is the right word there. How do you convince people that this is awesome and should be paid attention to? Yeah. You know, a lot of times when we're considering new features, we, we look at it not only from, uh, sort of the usefulness of, of the feature, but the story that we can tell around it. And, you know, when you look at something like Watchtower in 1Password 7 or, you know, drag and drop and support within, you know, other apps, those are those are wonderful stories that we can tell. And when you can wrap something up in in a relatable way and present it to the customer and say, look, here is a thing that you need and here's here's why, then then it becomes something compelling and it becomes easy to talk about. Um, if we just threw a bunch of new features at the wall and and you know, say, well, here's here's a here's a handful of things we did, and we didn't have a compelling way to talk about it. Then, of course, like it's just going to fall flat. Uh, so we really try to find like you know three three to five things that we can really sort of hitch our wagon to and and craft. Boy, I sound real. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, really really tell a great story around. Like I, I found I find a lot of success with that approach, and and so far it, it's it's panning out with with one password seven because i've i've basically been living in the one password mentions feed on twitter lately just seeing what people are saying as as they go by and and uh, seeing people latch on to these stories that we're trying to tell of like oh my gosh i just did this and it was amazing or holy i mean the big one has been two factor auth right holy cow look at all these websites i didn't know that supported two factor authentication amazing like these are this this is how we how we create momentum around a new product and i think that apple is particularly great at that of course like you look at the you know the the vignettes that they put together the ads that they put together uh, you know they send out to youtube and stuff like that uh, around here's the new update here's the things that are coming with it you know and they they always tell it in some awesome awesome cinematic way and and at the end of it you're like i need that thing like i i need that software update i need i need it because of this i mean the facetime ads are the perfect example of that right of like you're on a business trip and you get to see your loved ones across the country. Like those, those types of, of things really help push a product. So Apple in particular obviously has to, has to craft those types of stories, both around hardware and, and software launches. And I think that hardware like iPhone 10 
is easier to tell those stories than maybe the iPhone 8 was compared to the 7. I mean, iPhone 10, it's like, well, here's an emoji and here's like face ID and like all these, uh, like, I mean, iPhone 10 is quite frankly the best iPhone they've ever made. So, you know, those stories become easy to tell. Um, but that's, they're very, very good at it. And we try to, we try and, and sort of follow in their footsteps a bit. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do we want to sort of go around and say one thing we hope? To, I think people end up liking that. One thing we hope to see at WWDC for sure. Uh, I'm going to start so that nobody steals mine because I'm selfish. Um, I really, really, really want Siri to be as close to uh, feature parity across all of the different platforms because I why why can't I say? yo siri on my mac can you please turn off the lights in my office why can't i do that why is HomeKit not available on my mac that's so sad that's so disappointing i just want siri to be as good on the mac as it is elsewhere which is you know it, it has its problems elsewhere so at least as good as that right Ugh. uh let's go Lori next I would really like to see a better version of the mail app on Mac. It's it's very outdated and they're doing these these minor updates that that help make it better, but really it needs a, a redesign from the ground up. So my my hope would be that they do something different for the Mac uh, mail app. I use third party mail apps that work wonderfully. In fact, I use Newton and I, I will never stray from Newton because it's the best. But I, I don't, I, I, if I ever have to open the mail app for any reason, like if we're doing a guide or something for iMore, I dread opening it. <laughs> so I think the mail app on Mac needs to be completely redesigned. I would love to see Apple do that. You get to choose who's next. Oh, um, Michael, let's see what you have to say. Oh, man. Okay, so this is, a, this is a tough one for me because I haven't been paying as much as much attention as I should to rumors and stuff lately. But, you know, the one that's ever present, of course, is uh, Apple bringing UI kit to the Mac. Like, I, I think that they I think that they are probably setting themselves up for, you know, some some toolkit fundamentals uh, that are going to be rolled out on the Mac side. And maybe it's just because I just got done creating a Mac app that I'm I'm really excited to see what comes to the Mac next. It, regardless, like one of the things that we do, and this sort of strays a little bit from the question, Micah, but I'm going to take the tangent anyway, <laughs> is, um, you know, we try to wind down development ahead of WWDC every year because for a lot of the things that, that Serenity said, which was, you know, just the excitement of going into it, but also we want to see what Apple announces and then we jump on it. Like immediately, I remember uh, in 2000, no, wait, wait, I don't remember the year, iOS 8, when they introduced like, hey, third party apps can use Touch ID. Like we downloaded the SDK right away and went back to the hotel and whipped and integrated Touch ID with one password like that day. And then we had videos that we were showing around to like some of our, our friends at Apple and stuff. We're like, look what we did. And they're like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, you did that already. Uh, so um you know, we we and since then, like we've done that every year. Like we we try to launch a big one password update alongside the Mac or the iOS updates to take advantage of of all the cool stuff has all the cool stuff Apple has announced. So that's really what I'm looking forward to is just like that next big thing that we can just grab onto and integrate into one password and then be, you know, ready to ready to rock in the fall. Awesome. All right, Rin. You want a list? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's why I wanted her to go last. <laughs> the smart Save the best oh smart. my God. All right. Uh, let's, I'm going to start with services. Uh, Cause I feel like that's a, <laughs> I love we'll this. just, we'll I go, just we'll picture... go section by section. You Subsection a, a with like red lines drawn. Red <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's really not that big. Uh, it's mostly, honestly, it's things that bug me in everyday life that I'm like, ah, I wish this could be a little bit better. Uh, iCloud photo library. I've been asking for this for two years. I'm really hoping they offer some kind of advanced management for what you can store on your device and what you can't. I love optimized storage. I think it's an amazing feature that they've built in. Uh, but there are times when I want to keep 
certain albums or certain photos or certain videos that I'm trying to edit from getting disappeared <laughs> up into the cloud. There was a point mm -hmm. where I was in the middle of working on an iMovie project and all of a sudden I had to re-download my entire section because it was like, oh yeah, we're just gonna move these videos away. I'm like, no, but, but I was working on, them. yeah. So, uh, and maybe like having iMovie talk a little bit better to iCloud Photo Library in that regard. In any case, better better management on the optimized side. Otherwise, I think iCloud Photo Library is an amazing service, and I'm really I'm really excited about how it has evolved. Um, I'm also hoping for more storage in general for iCloud users. Uh, you, you've seen Google has now kind of matched Apple in terms of uh, the paid storage with Google One, uh, but I'm really hoping that Apple decides, hey, you know what? We're about to be a trillion dollar company. Maybe five gigabytes of free storage is like just a little bit, a little bit stingy. Maybe we can bump it up at least to fifteen. Or hey, a hundred. Imagine that, a hundred gigabytes of free storage. <laughs> uh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, it would be swell. Uh, I don't think they will bump it up to a hundred, but I would like to at least achieve feature parity. With I think Google I think one. fifteen is a reasonable request. I think is it um, is it Google that gives fifteen, 15. Uh, seventeen free? Yeah. So I think fifteen is a reasonable free tier upgrade without you know with well still you know like i i couldn't use 15 i would need more but there's a lot of people i know who only need 15 so it would be perfect for for the people who are still kind of not heavy cloud users you know i think that's great i would love yeah, that for <laughs> sure um apple music I think Apple Music has gotten a lot better. Again, it's been almost three years at this point since Apple Music's been launched. Um, I love the curation that their behind the scenes folks are doing. I would love playlists to be a little bit more easily accessible. Uh, we've seen what, uh, what Spotify is doing with all of their discovery mixes and everything else. And Apple Music's big sell right now is the integration with Siri and HomePod. Uh, and if they can step it up even a further notch and really provide it, here's the thing. I would love for HomePod to recommend playlists to me. I can currently say things like, you know, play pot, like play party music or something like that. And it'll play the first party music thing that comes off of the list. But I would really like to be able to ask it like, what are some good party playlists? And have HomePod be like, well, there's this, there's this, there's this, which mm -hmm. one would you like? Mm -hmm. And being able to just be like, I'd like to listen to this one. Thanks HomePod. Or, <laughs> What have I listened to lately? You know, um, I just I think there's there can be some smarter Siri integrations because that's really I mean that is Apple's chief selling point right now with Apple Music. The the curation is great, but Spotify also has great curation. Um, and unless they they can really leverage the the assets that they do have, they're gonna risk kind of staying at feature parity with Spotify and and user parity. Like even there's a certain point where they're gonna hit market saturation and they're not gonna be able to keep on overtaking Spotify and users. Uh, okay, so that's services. Uh, watch um i want custom watch bases i've been asking yes. for it forever like and developer designed yes like, yeah that would be super yes. sweet well because we've all right so here's the, here's the thing all of the infra like the necessary infrastructure is kind of there and that we've already experimented with complications we have the fact that you can swipe watch faces left or right mm -hmm. having custom watch faces quite honestly is the next step from complications to apps it's what apple was trying to do with glances in watch os one um and just didn't really succeed at doing it because glances were very buggy and very slow and didn't always work uh but i would love to see custom complicated like full-on custom watch faces and also because it would just look cool on it like the apple watch and i've said this many times is still the only viable smartwatch for anybody with wrists smaller than that of a giant uh and it's it's everywhere honestly like i know apple hasn't officially released numbers but like i have been I have been in tech cities and rural areas and non-tech cities. You know, when I'm when I'm up in Montreal, I basically see it on almost everybody's wrists, and it's it's crazy. It's crazy how how many people of different ages and weights and sizes and body like and and races and colors and creeds and like everybody is wearing this, and it's it's which is awesome. But personalization would be great. I really love the activity rings, right? I love I love the activity view. 
from a technical standpoint, I hate the way that it looks on my wrist. Mm -hmm. I just, it's very colorful <laughs> and <laughs> doesn't, doesn't always go well with every outfit that I wear. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be nice. Um, I am also kind of looking forward to, again, more Siri integration on the watch. Watch and Siri is something that I use every single day, partially because it's so much better than any other, like maybe next to HomePod. I think HomePod has the same kind of veracity on its microphone, but HomePod has an incredibly limited set of skills, mm -hmm. whereas Watch is much closer in parity to the iPhone, but it's much more advanced in its record. Like, I can sit here, I can have the watch, you know, at my side, I can say the trigger word and then give my command and it will dictate it all per like perfectly. I, I go so far, I think I've talked about this before, I use the watches Siri when I'm driving to dictate messages and to change songs and all of that because it's the watch understands me so much better than my car's like subpar microphone. Wow. It's such a good it's it's like a it's a life hack. It's it's wonderful. Yeah, pro I tip. Yeah. Minute, Serenity. Now, see, I have a series one and you're making me want, like now you're telling me why I have to go buy a series. Like, that, <laughs> I that's, mean, thanks. Yeah. that's great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Serenity yeah. does that a lot. Gets, I, I, we, we all end up buying things because of <laughs> Yeah. Where's your Ember mug, Micah? <laughs> it's, it's right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so, and then the last thing for watch, quite honestly, I want a software development kit for developers that isn't, pile of crap. Sorry, watch engineers. I know you guys are working really, really hard and it's not to shit on your private prior efforts. I understand that you were very, very hardware constrained, but the series three and quite honestly, the series one have enough junk in their trunk, so to speak, <laughs> that I feel like an actual watch SDK can be presented. Like the watch has gotten far enough in advance that I don't think developers need to be hindered. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think we need to have full-fledged apps, like iPhone apps on the watch. I've played some watch games and most of them are terrible, even with, sorry, it's like, it's pretty, but like too many 3D graphics is not great. Then you have games like Pocket Bandit that do it really well, or Lifeline that do it really well, that keep things like short and simple and, and allow you like very, very simplistic things. Uh, but I would love, like, there are, there are things that I know that apps just simply can't do right now, where there's... I've run into so many buggy watch apps and I have a, I have an unfinished compilation of like, literally it, it used to be called best Apple watch apps. And then I changed it at some point to Apple watch apps that don't suck uh, <laughs> because it's uh, yeah, it, it's really, really hard to make an Apple watch app that works reliably and works consistently given all the parameters and restrictions that Apple has had to put into place because of past Apple Watch hardware. So I'm really hoping that we see an overhaul in terms of how Apple thinks about Apple Watch apps, especially with all the health kit and the research kit stuff. Like there's a huge opportunity here uh, for developers to really capitalize on it. Uh, but in order for developers to be able to make successful watch apps, they need a, an SDK that actually supports them. So I'm hopeful for that. Uh, and I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's just like full stop. Uh, and iPhone side, I will be quick. Please move control center from its terrible place in on the iPhone 10. I always swipe on the wrong direction. I mm. feel like there is a better way. There must be a better way, please God. Uh, and I want more advanced options in camera, like, or even even more, I want the ability to put a third party camera app as that little quick shortcut button on my home screen or on not on my home screen, on my lock screen. Because there are great third-party apps, um, and Apple seems so far content to let the third-party apps be the hardcore heavy-duty apps. And you've got things like Halide and Obscura 2, which just launched today. Uh, you've got these wonderful, wonderful third-party apps. Uh, but if it's so clunky where you're like, oh, I want to take this cute picture, then swipe, <laughs> face ID, find the... Okay, and then by that point, the the cat has already, you know, turned its butt to you or something like that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. So I am. I'm hoping for more advancements, in, both in that side of photography. I want more advances. I want to see what they're doing to further improve portrait, especially with uh, Core ML um, and AR. Uh, I'm really excited mm. about what they're doing yes. with MLA and, and AR. I feel like that's going to be huge. Uh, 
health kit and research kit. I that I should have said that in services, but again, I'm 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 I really want to hear what crazy new health initiative that they're gonna unle- unveil. Uh, unveil. I know how you know I've been talking too long. Uh, <laughs> unveil. That's an English word. Uh, yeah, I I want to. I really admire Apple's dedication to the health and you know health and research industry. And it's clear that it's something that is very, very important to them. And I'm, I'm curious just to see how they're going to continue upping that, that bar and continuing like to develop that. Uh, and finally, I'm really looking forward to all of the adorable kids and scholarship winners that are going to come in because they are the next generation of Apple developers. They're the next, gener- they're honestly our next generation uh, that are going to develop some amazing, incredible things. And uh, I I appreciate so greatly that Apple does this program. I think it's really special for these kids. Um, And I hope uh, hope it's just as cool as it was last year. Like I remember being in the keynote and uh, the keynote being over and all of us turning to leave. And Renee and I, of course, stayed around for an extra five minutes typing frantically because that's what we do. Um, And then turning around and seeing like, Tim gathering with like all this, the scholarship recipients and like taking a cute, a really adorable photo. And it's like, <laughs> that's sweet. This is, this is what, this is, this is what this is for. This is what WWDC is about, is about making connections and inspiring people and letting them go forth and creating the next awesome generation of software. Awesome. Uh, well, we are just about out of time, but before we round out the show, I do want to quickly touch on um, Apple's new privacy portal. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure many of you out there have received about 100 trillion different emails from different services that you're signed up for saying, uh, we're updating this for GDPR, 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 GDPR. Um, I have been reminded that I've signed up for different services that I didn't even know I signed up for because of GDPR, all of it. Um, but Apple has a new data and privacy portal. You can go there, you sign in with your Apple ID. If you live in the, if you do not live in the EU, then you go there and you have two options. You can either check for, um, you can, you you can make updates to data that Apple has that you may think there's like an error with. So you you can kind of go in and say, okay, uh, here's where I go to change my Apple ID, my name, my email address, all that kind of stuff. Or you can actually go in and delete your account. You used to have to call Apple support and sort of cross your fingers and hope that they let you do it. And you had to, you know, say the right passwords at the right places and do the, the proper handshakes and none of that anymore. I'm sorry to those of you who learned, you know, how to, how to hop on one foot while singing the national anthem. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, It's very simple, although it is an involved process that can take up to seven days because they verify each request. Um, So I had an account that I had created that I went through and did the, the delete thing. So I'm looking forward to seeing how they sort of reach out and verify the deletion. Uh, If you do live in the EU, you're lucky because you can also request a copy of your data. You go in and you can check box, okay, I want this, 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 this. It sort of breaks it down into different categories. So you can see a bunch of different stuff, like every app that you've downloaded, your transaction history, all this stuff. And then Apple will send you a file that has all that data in it and you can download it and and peek through it. I'm hoping and I'm assuming that eventually that uh, feature will come to everyone uh, so that anybody anywhere can download that data and, and get a hold of that. Any, uh, any thoughts on GDPR in general? Any thoughts on this new privacy portal? Are you hoping that we all get the EU's blessed feature? Gosh, I, I hope so. Yeah, I think the best thing to come out of the GDPC, uh, sorry, GDPR, um, Uh, initiative act regulation um, is that the U.S. is seeing some of these uh, features for for our own personal benefit. And it's not only is it just really nice to be able to like have that kind of transparency, it's something that that companies have been, they've chosen not to give us in the past, but it also helps us realize how important this kind of 
transparency is and hopefully help us to enact those kind of regulations in the US in the future too. So I'm all in for all of this, all, all these companies. I think I saw a tweet this morning of uh, somebody making a joke about it saying, I opened my cereal box and got the new privacy policy. <laughs> <laughs> it's everywhere and I love it. I, I want I want this, I, you know, I love this change. So I'm looking forward to it for sure. I hope we get the full download your data from Apple soon. I'm sure they're going to do it. it they probably just had to make sure it rolled out safely in your in the Europe before they spread it around the rest of the world. So yeah, it's something that definitely changed a few key things within the company as we were working on GD GDPR compliance. And it was like, well, you know, so happily, you know, we have we actually have one password.ca and one password.eu uh, servers as well. So it was uh, you know part of part of the ability, uh, you know, with GDPR, you know, we had these servers, we have, I think that our, our .eu instance is hosted in, in Germany. And, and so it was, it was great to sort of take that and, and look at the, you know, the GDPR component and be like, okay, I think we're all set here and then just change a few processes. And we were, we were good. We did not send out email. I don't believe, I think that we have just, we have a nice thing on our website that says, yes, we're GDPR compliant, but, oh, yes. uh, I think that we saved everyone's inbox a little bit. <laughs> Uh, well, all of you, uh, please stay posted. I just mailed out my updated terms and conditions for you all, so you should be getting that in the mail soon. Um, all right. That is another episode of the iMore Show. Thank you all so much for listening. Let's go ahead and go around. Michael Fay, of course, thank you for joining us. If people are looking for you online, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Rooney. It's M-R-R-O-O-N-I. Uh, but you should just skip right to onepassword.com and sign up for a, for a one password membership because it's great. And, uh, yeah, we just, we just shipped an awesome update. So go get that. Do it. Do so it. Really just do it well. Yes. You, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Saturn, S-E-T-T-E-R-N, as well as on Instagram, on iMore, and on Relay FM, where I am doing a show called Query with Stephen Hackett, where we answer your tech questions. And you can find me at WWDC in a week and a half. Woo! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> where she will be uh, recounting that list of things that needs to happen at WWDC. She'll be cornering engineers. <laughs> yeah, Listen. going to the labs and being like, excuse me, I have a question. <laughs> you forgot <laughs> to mention this feature that you're supposed Hi, to have. I, I, don't, I don't know if you, if, if you recognize me, but I'm celebrity uh, podcaster, <laughs> Serenity Caldwell, and I have a request. I'm Z-list celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lori Gale, if people are looking for you online, where can they find you? I will be having a slumber party with Serenity at WWDC, and uh, they can find me at Appaholic on Twitter. That's A P P A H, sorry, A P P A H O L I K. And if there were a such thing as a physical one password vault, I would be snuggled up in it right now because it's a very secure and safe place to be. Uh, phys <laughs> physical one password vaults coming soon. Uh <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Stay posted. Um, if you were, if Renee were here, he would tell you you can find him at Renee Ritchie on most things. You can also find his show Vector. It's video, it's podcast, it's articles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you're looking for me online, you can find me at Micah Sargent on most things. Uh, you can also check out the new podcast that I do for dream interpretation and sleep science called Lucid. That's at Lucid Podcast, I think, or at Lucid Show, something. Just look up Lucid. You can also go to chihuahua.coffee c-h-i-h-u-a-h-u-a.coffee -H -H for all the links to all the things i do you can of course find us all on uh imore and i want to thank jim metzendorf for editing the show and making us all sound great despite any technical difficulties we will be back next week with loads more to talk about all of you have a wonderful rest of your week or weekend and goodbye until next time Au revoir. Au revoir. thank you everybody all righty.